It's good to see uh, Frank Seymour up here as well. Frank had a retirement party uh, yesterday, and uh, so he's retired, and um, looks like uh, he's going back to work in a week, though, right? His boss came to his retirement party and said, I'm hiring you part-time again starting next week. <laughs> so there's no rest for him. So, all right. Take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Acts this morning. Acts chapter number 6. And we'll pick it up in just a moment in verse number 8. I will tell you, uh, we've kind of shared some of these things with you before, but to kind of bring us up to speed as we gather back for uh, today's chapter. Acts is a book of firsts because it introduces us to many things for the very first time. Uh, Acts chapter 1 is the, the first time that ministry is entrusted after Jesus has ascended, entrusted to, to men and humans. The first time... Uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. The first time that, that some gifts of the Spirit were in operation. It's the first time in Acts chapter 2 that an evangelistic message was preached. We find also the first time converts get saved in the early church. Chapter 3 has the first miracle of the early church. That's the healing of the crippled man. Chapter 4, we find the first opposition to the early church. Chapter 5 is the first judgment in the early church with the death of Ananias and Sapphira and their hypocrisy. Chapter 6 is where we find the first governance structure of the early church in the selection of deacons. And as the chapter continues into where we will read today and into chapter 7, we find the first martyr. We find the first martyr of the early church, and his name is Stephen. Let's pick it up here in Acts chapter 6, verse number nine, uh, 8. Here's what we're, we're going to do. Pay attention. We're going to read from verse 8 to chapter 7, verse 1, and then we will skip to chapter 7, verse 54. Here we go, chapter 6 and verse number 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people. And uh, elders and the elders and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Then said the high priest, are these things so? Now Stephen at that point begins to preach a lengthy message, and uh, they don't like it. We'll talk about that in the message, but let's pick up the reading again in verse number 54 of chapter 7. When they heard these things... They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Please don't do that to me today if I preach some truth, all right? But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Sleeping, falling asleep in Jesus is a euphemistic way, a softer way in uh, Bible culture, Bible language to say death. Don't mistake what happened here. He did not just take a nap. He did not pass out. He died. Stephen is the first martyr, and we'll see today in this message entitled, Stephen Stands Tall. How Stephen Stands Tall. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that just as we see the first martyr, the first person that died, 
for the gospel. I pray that the point for our lives is that we would live for the gospel. And I pray that we'd see that today and we'd be willing to make sacrifices to put our love for you above our love of anything else, to take a stand courageously, compassionately, clearly, to take a stand for the gospel in this world that likes to focus on the law, focus on works and religious things, but not the simple grace gospel. Help us to always be a church that stands on the simple grace gospel, salvation by grace through faith, not of ourselves, but only because of what Jesus Christ has provided for us. I pray that you'll speak to us and teach us things today in the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Around the world, the power of the gospel has taken root in places where the blood of the martyrs has been spilled. A person uh, certain can, certainly can give uh, his life for the gospel, but before, my friends, you can give your life for the gospel, you must live your life for the gospel. We are introduced in Acts chapter 6 and then chapter 7 to a man named Stephen who did just that. His name, by the way, means crown. And he certainly is going to receive and has received the martyr's crown. He's the first person in Scripture to give his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, he was a Greek-speaking Jew that was uh, one of the seven godly men that the congregation in the early church here in the first part of Acts chapter 6 chose and elected and recognized as someone who they could, they could trust in to take care of the physical needs of the matters of the church so that the apostles could be more given to prayer and preaching. Let's examine his testimony, his amazing testimony today by looking at three simple points. Number one is Stephen the witness. Stephen the witness. He was a man of God. Uh, filling in the blanks from uh, just a few verses before when he was chosen among six other men to be uh, the first deacon uh, uh, board of the early church. He was a man of faith. He was a man of a godly reputation. He was a man full of wisdom and he was a man full of the Holy Ghost. There, there was evidence in, in Stephen's life of all these things. You see that word um, faith. Look at that word again uh, just in your Bibles quickly. Verse number eight, and Stephen full of faith. You see that word faith? You see it? Say yes. yes. All right, you see it? Well, that's actually the Greek word for grace, translated here, uh, uh, faith. But what it means is that Stephen was a person of grace, that Stephen, this, this martyr, that Stephen, this bold witness, this bold preacher, he was a, also a person who was gracious and kind and gentle. F.F. F. Bruce has written many commentaries. F.F. F. Bruce says that if this verse were translated into today's language, it would tell us that Stephen was charming, that he was charming. So now listen, what that means is for us today is that it is possible for us to be a man or a woman of courage, a, a, a person of faith, a person of strong conviction. It's possible to be all those things while at the same time being a fun people person. I think we need to rethink in our minds the idea that the deeper you go with God, the gloomier you look and the grumpier, more grumpier you act. For some reason, Stephen was also, the Bible tells us, was given the same kind of power, though he was not an apostle, he was given the same kind of the power of God to do miracles and to do wonders, just like some of the apostles were given at this dispensation at this juncture in church history. Up to this point, only the apostles had power, but now Stephen has some sort of ability to do miracles, as we're told at the end of verse number eight. So not only was Stephen a person who, who reflected grace, who lived in a gracious and kind and charming way, even though he stood for truth, I'll tell you why he was able to do that. What made him a person who reflected the grace of God was because he was a person uh, who believed in the grace of God. He was a person, this, this is where the lines were being drawn back here in Bible history, where the lines were being very clearly marked between those who embrace the grace of God and those who embrace the works of the law. 
And so Stephen is beginning to stand apart. And this is, this is very evident that he, that he believes in the, the history of Israel and he believes in, in what, what, what has been pointed out and prophesied and laid out in Scripture. But it's a very lengthy sermon, which we'll examine just a little bit later. But this devotion to the grace of God, this realization he came to that it's not by works, it's not by righteousness, not by keeping the Old Testament law, this realization he came to that, that, that the grace of God is the only way we can approach uh, and, and, and enter heaven with God. This is why Satan wanted him stopped. This is why the religious leaders put a stop and they wanted uh, him to be dead. And that's why he had the, the target on his back from the Sanhedrin. Stephen was becoming a person of influence. He was becoming a person that was making a difference for the gospel. And those people that were opposed to the gospel did not like it one bit. And it was creating real problems with the religious leaders of the time. So what Stephen was teaching and preaching. Uh, and he, we see an example of it given here in really the bulk of chapter seven, but we, we just hearing at the end of chapter six that, that he's going around, he's being known, he's being recognized, he's making an impact in the community. There's, there's different people that are, that are trusting in the grace gospel apart from their works. And so what he was doing was causing a theological war. God's grace was changing people's hearts. God's grace was changing people's lives in fact, we even learned from verse number seven, we didn't read this verse this morning, but back up to it or look at it real quickly. It says that, that, that disciples were being multiplied. And by the way, that's the goal. That, that's the goal. God, here at our church, God's grace inspires us to uh, seek connection, to pursue growth, and to be sent so that we and other people in this community that don't yet know Jesus Christ can be developed into fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to see discipleship multiply. We want to see the disciple, disciples grow in our church. But also says in verse number seven, I'm sorry, I'm just preaching a little bit today, uh, uh, if you don't mind. The Bible also says that a great company of priests were turning to the faith. A great company of priests were obedient to the simple gospel and putting their faith in Jesus Christ. So many, many of the Old Testament, there's tons of synagogues. I'll tell you how many in a second, but there's tons of synagogues and tons of religious orders and groups. And this one is called the synagogue of the free men or the libertines where Stephen is, is, is preaching in this particular chapter. There's tons of priests and there's hundreds, hundreds, and they're turning to the Lord and they're realizing all these things that we do, these sacrifices that we run and these things we do for God's people, these are just pictures Jesus Christ has already accomplished all these things and they're, they're turning from that. They're, they're, they're realizing it's not by the law. It's not by works. It's not by my religiosity and it's causing a real, you feel this, right? It's causing a real tension in this religious world. Well, at the time, there were about 480 synagogues in uh, dotting Jerusalem and in this area. This one is called the synagogue of the freedmen. It was made up, evidently, history tells us, of the children of freed Jewish slaves. Since it was filled with Greek Jews, uh, Stephen, being a Greek Jew, apparently had found his way into this particular synagogue, and he was teaching and preaching the truth, and it was stirring up a debate. And I really, really like verse number 10. Please, please notice we keep going back to Scripture today. I heard from a friend today that visited a church in another part of Tennessee, and he said they never opened their Bibles. The preacher stood up, and they never opened their Bibles. So please understand, I have not, nothing to say apart from what the Bible uh, says today. So look, at, I really like verse number, number 10. It says, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Oh man, what, what a great prayer for me as a preacher to pray. What a great desire that we would have that, uh, for, for our lives that as we preach or as we teach or as we witness or as we share our faith and share the gospel that people would be so uh, 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 impacted by not just what we say but how we say it. We're, we're, we're really good, I know I'm, I can be really good sometimes at offending people. I can be really good, I'm sure, at putting people to sleep with my uh, deep, resonant voice. Uh, uh, it's not time to bow your heads and close your eyes yet. Wait about 20 minutes. All right, wake back up. I'm not done preaching yet. All right, wake up. I, I, I want to live, I want to encourage us all to live our lives in the way that Stephen lived, lived his life, that these people were not able to resist the wisdom and the power that Stephen had. Nobody could match him. No one could, no one could, could match his wits and his wisdom. And so these religious leaders, they thought they, were, they, they thought they were hot stuff, but they could not 
uh, they were not strong enough, they were not powerful enough, they were not wise enough to prevail in being able to speak against his doctrine. His doctrine was sound, his doctrine was true, his doctrine was, w- w- was truthful, he was preaching and presenting grace, the grace of God. And these religious leaders were bothered by that, but they could not outsmart him, they could not outthink him, and they could not, uh, they could not stop him. I love what is revealed here. That the word of God has power. That, that when the word of God, listen to me, when the word of God is faithfully communicated, it ought to be communicated in such a way it is so powerful, it is so clearly driven by the Holy Spirit, it is so clear that people cannot refute anything. They might not like it, they might refuse it, but they can't argue with truth. And so what happens is when the word of God is clearly articulated, clearly communicated in a church or at a teaching life group session, that, it, that the Holy Spirit then fuses with that, comes alongside the Holy Spirit, takes that living truth and, and, and enlightens it and, and, and runs that truth right into the minds and hearts of even enemies of the truth. Even enemies are left defenseless. And please remember, it's not just what is said, it's how it is said. And Stephen teaches us that when we are witnessing to others, when we are sharing our faith and inviting folks to church, uh, it, our spirit is just as important as our speech. People are watching you, Calvary. People are watching us, how we respond on social media, the things we say, how we respond to minor inconveniences in stores and restaurants. They're watching us. What we say is just as important as our spirit. So because they couldn't stop him, they had to discredit him. If you can't win publicly, try something nasty in private. That's the uh, tactic. People who are out to destroy a minister or a, a ministry do a lot of secret things. They have secret meetings. They have secret petitions. They have secret discussions. They form secret committees. There are people in churches that do not have the integrity, not this church, I'm speaking in general, there's people that don't have integrity to do things truthfully or forthrightly, and so they just work behind the scenes. And they coordinate things, and they have an agenda. And what the Bible tells us is when it says they suborned men, it means they secretly induced people to say things about Stephen. Hey, hey, he's doing this. Go tell somebody. And if you don't like something, you're going to tell 10 people. All right? If you like something, you'll tell one person. You say you don't like it, you'll tell 10 people. Don't go to that restaurant. Hey, don't go to that church. Don't go there. They're not whatever, and you'll, you'll have an opinion about it. So they secretly got people, induced men and, and people to speak against Stephen. Their plan was to accuse him of blasphemy. It was a smear campaign. More of that coming in 2024, I guarantee it, before we get up to November. What a joke this is. The, the, these are the very people who killed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, and they are accusing Stephen of blasphemy. In fact, there's so much here that parallels Jesus Christ. What they're doing to Stephen parallels almost exactly what they did to Christ. Falsely accuse him. Uh, they, they bring in witnesses to testify against him. They stir up the people to accuse him of attacking the law of Moses and the temple. And finally, just like they did to Jesus Christ, they execute him. Before he knows it, He's standing before this same council that tried Jesus and the apostles. And verse 15, I love it, verse 15 of chapter 6 tells us that the glow of Stephen's face told everyone that he was at peace, that he was a servant of God, and that he was full of grace. I love the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 reminds us in our moments of, in, of, of darkness and discouragement that God's grace is sufficient for us. That when we are weak, he shines through us in a very strong way. That when, when we are weak, his strength is made perfect in us. I, I know there's family here today and there's folks here that are going through deep valleys and I'm telling you there is grace for you and there is grace to hold you up in times of sorrow and there's grace for future decisions that must be made and there's grace for the sorrow you're going through and for the trial that you're going to go through this week and there's grace for the loss that you are enduring and there's grace for the temptations that you will have to fight this week and, and for the stress that you'll go through this week. There's grace, all the pressure we have. It, it is that grace 
and I, 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 I need it, and you need it, and we need that grace. We go through times we just can't think. We don't think we can keep going. We just can't make it. We're going to buckle under the pressure, and yet here comes God's grace to hold us up when we are at our weak point. It, that, that grace sets us apart when we feel like we're going to come apart. And that's what Stephen is manifesting. That's what he's clearly revealing on his face. So like, like the, the, this beginning to be the worst possible moment of his life, but yet he's glowing. He's glowing. I think about how little it takes to tick us off. How, what kind of minor things really derail us and distract us from our, just staying true to our purpose and staying true to our Lord? Believer, listen to me today, men and women, if, if Stephen could glow in this situation, then you and I can glow with the grace of God through whatever we might face. God's most likely, almost certainly, not going to call us to die for our faith in this exact way or die for our faith at all. We're so blessed. We don't suffer this kind of persecution and martyrdom is not gonna be the number one way that any of us die. So compared to martyrdom, we're not gonna go through very much. It's difficult comparatively. And if Stephen can glow, if Stephen can show the grace of God in what is the darkest trial of his life, then I'll tell you something. Uh, uh, I wanna encourage us all. We can glow. The grace, there's grace for us too. There's grace just like he had, grace for even smaller ordeals and, and pressures and stresses that we go through. But we can, we can glow and we can have grace as well, no matter what we face. Well, that's number one, Stephen the witness. Now we turn into Stephen the preacher. Now you wait for this. This is good. Stephen the preacher. And um, Stephen was certainly a man of faith. Hey, church, how do you get faith? What does the Bible say? Where do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing. Help me out. And hearing by word of God. And so uh, that's Romans 10, 17, by the way. The fact that, that Stephen was a man of faith means that he read his Bible. He studied his Bible. He memorized his Bible. He knew his Bible. And the evidence is Acts chapter 7. It's not boring. You should set aside some time to read it. It's 60 verses. And we're not going to read all of it today. You're welcome. It's, on, it's for yourself to read later. It's a magnificent sermon. And we stop right there at verse number one where, where the, the, the climax is building and the pressure is on Stephen and, and, and they're about to get really angry at him and they look at him and they say, hey, Stephen, are these things so? <laughs> He's like, I thought you'd never ask. All right, he rolls up his sleeves. He's like, you guys ready for this? Take a seat. And Stephen, listen to me, he launches off into 1,100 years of Jewish history. Just like off the cuff. Just from memory. I mean, it, he, he begins without any notes. I mean, he just extemporaneously just goes off and he, he just goes into defending himself from these charges. And in response, he goes through from memory the entire history of Israel. He, he goes from Abraham to Jacob to Joseph to Moses to Joshua, to David, to Solomon. He goes back to Egypt and slavery. He goes to the wilderness. He talks about the promised land, the temple. He even knew where Abraham was buried and he knew the names of the men who he bought the burial plot from. And you read it later. I have to paint this morning in broad strokes because it's a long sermon, but it's wonderful. But in great detail, he indicts them. He would have had to know scripture to do this. That's the answer to victory in our Christian lives. How many of you believe that, that if you were to, to, to preach 60 verses or 54 verses of a message and go through the entire history of church life and, 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 and Israel's history, you'd have to know your Bible. He knew his Bible. And, and, and the Bible says he was full of faith. May I remind you that if your Bible collects dust from Sunday to Saturday, you're not a spiritual person. Without that, without feeding on the Word of God, you are not, you, we cannot be spiritual. Read it. Read the book. Think about in the spring of the year, we, we always see these Scott's Turf Builder fertilizer commercials. I love that guy. It says, feed your lawn. Feed it. Read it. Read the Bible. Read it. 
Study it, the Bible says in Psalm 119.16. Uh, that was a weird reference. I'm sorry about the commercial there. All right. Uh, I will delight myself in the statutes. I will not forget thy word. Study it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved. This is our Awana theme verse. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, so read it, study it, memorize it. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But yet, this sermon was more than just a recitation of facts. Preaching is that. Preaching is more than just an ongoing revolving commentary. Preaching involves boldness. It involves authority. I stand here by God's grace in the place of God, opening up the Word of God to, to pray that the Spirit of God develops us all into the image of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for the glory of God. This is not some minor thing we do today, every Sunday. And so Stephen is not just reciting facts. I'm telling you, Stephen was standing there and he was given this, he was overwhelmed with this boldness of the Holy Spirit and he's just letting them have it both barrels. Are gun references still allowed in 2024? I don't know. Okay, and here they are. Good, I'm safe. We'll just take that out of the live stream. All right. I mean, he's just, mm. It's a wild, wild west with Steve. He's just, and you did this, and you forgot this, and you, did, you ignored that, and you were stubbornly refusing that. He's just, <laughs> guns are blazing. It was an indictment on the Jewish nation that they were guilty of worse sins than they were accusing Stephen of committing. Do you see the irony here? Like, are you, are you serious? Are you, are you for real? You're blaspheming our religious... You killed the Messiah. You killed the Son of God. And they're accusing him of blasphemy and they're accusing him of doing all these things. And he talks about the patriarchs. And he talks about the prophets. And he talks about the place, the temple that they desecrated. He says, you forgot your spiritual roots. You rejected the prophets that God sent to warn you and teach you. You disobeyed the law. You missed the purpose of the law. You worshipped false idols. You despised your own temple. And, and, he, and as he talks about these things, listen, he talks about the prophets and the patriarchs and the place, and he says, none of these things, the, the patriarchs, the prophet, and the place, none of these things can save you. Salvation is not found in any of those things. It is found in a person named Jesus Christ. Oh, and that's what really got him. And I need you to see the, uh, the, the, the big deal of this message. Go over uh, in chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 53. Oh, I love to hear your pages of your Bible turning. Thank you so much for bringing the Bible. You need them here at this church. Everyone there say got it. Acts 7.51. You got it? Here we go. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Why do ye do always resist Holy Ghost as your fathers did so do ye? I look up this way. We'll read in a second. It might have been going well until that point. <laughs> Uh, he might have he might have escaped with his life, but that's where man that's where the gavel comes down. That's where the hammer. It's like all right, let me let me let me let me get right there in your face. All right, he gets up in their grill. He says, "You're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised in your heart." Verse fifty-two. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them from uh, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now uh, the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. They don't like it, church. They don't like it, and people still don't like it today. They need to hear it, but they're not going to like it. The same thing that this religious world isn't going to like. What every person here needs to understand is that almost all religions of the world, almost all religious people in the world believe that either the Old Testament law or their works 
or their church will save them. Most people believe, truly, here's what they believe, and they believe it sincerely, but they're sincerely wrong, that if they just simply do the best they can, they will be so pleasing to God that God will have to let them into heaven. I keep the law. I love, there's so many video clips out there of, a, of, of, a, of an apologist, a preacher goes around and says, well, how do you think you're going to heaven? They say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. He says, name one of them. Uh, 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 do unto others as you would have yourself uh, no uh. he says don't you think it's ironic that you're trusting in the Ten Commandments to save you you can't even name what one of them is religious people are all wonky on this and so he says it's not about doing the best you can it's not about living up to some standard above your neighbor all of sin comes short of the glory of God not their neighbor and as a result of this misunderstanding and of the darkness and the refusing and the stiff necked nature of people people refuse to simply believe that Jesus Christ was the only lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and it baffles our minds those of us who have been blessed enough to receive the truth and respond to the gospel doesn't it baffle your minds why people don't just receive the simple gospel of Jesus Christ Christ. And if you truly grasp this, if you're truly committed to sharing to this religious world and this irreligious world uh, the, uh, that it's not the works of the law, that, it, that if you, you preach the truth of Jesus Christ, for some reason you'll be hated, you'll be mistreated, you'll be falsely accused, and perhaps you'll even be killed in some parts of this world today. They did it to Jesus. They did it to Stephen. It's still happening today. The Bible says that they were cut to the heart. This is verse number 54. They were cut to the heart. Hey, look up right here. <laughs> it's okay to be cut to the heart. The Bible says that my heart and your heart is desperately and deceitfully wicked. And I don't even... I'd like to trust in my heart. Follow your heart. Trust your heart. No, 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 no. They were cut. We, we need to be cut to the heart. That's called conviction. We don't see a whole lot of it anymore in churches. You know, we used to have, you know, pews. People would stand up and they'd wrap their, their hands around the wooden top of that pew and we called it white-knuckled conviction. They are just grabbing onto that because they felt in their core because of the power of God's word being preached and the, the willingness they had to listen to the Spirit. They felt like that they were sinners in the hands of an angry God. And I, I wonder how long it's been since you felt that white-knuckled conviction. You were really cut to the heart. I'm not here to impress you. I'm not, we're, we're not here to waste time and say, well, this is a nice little ditty from the Word of God today. What a nice little thought. We need to be convicted. We need to be challenged. We need to be changed. And I'll tell you something, just like them, in this religious world today and even among church people today, if we, when we are cut to the heart, when God brings conviction, there are two choices, hostility or humility. Which is it for you? When the Word of God cuts against the grain of your life, when it cuts against the grain of how you think, when it cuts against the grain of your methodology and the way you, you, you think, what, how do you respond? With hostility or with humility? Well, they responded with hostility, which brings us to point number three, which is Stephen, the martyr. Stephen, the martyr. And so we can't help but wonder if Stephen knew he was about to die. If Stephen knew he was likely before this same Sanhedrin group council that sentenced and crucified Jesus, he must have known, if I, if I go down this road, they're going to kill me. Preaching his own death sentence. Because these members of the council could not stand to have their evil motives exposed. They rose up and they stoned him right after he was done. And as a result, and we'll see this in the succeeding chapters in Acts, as a result of this persecution, it gets pretty serious in Acts chapter 8 and 9, and this is the persecution that dispersed the church. This is what scattered the church. Vicious persecution arose, but the church was scattered. They, they, they fled to the hills, but as they took, as they left, they carried the gospel with them wherever they went. But Stephen had grace to the end. I hope that God gives you and me grace to the end. 
matter how many years, whether it's 39 years or the age of Barbara Emmett, whatever it is, grace to the end. This is an excerpt from a letter by Lizzie Atwater to her sister just a few days before she and her husband were martyred in China. Quote, dear ones, I long for a sight of your dear faces, but I fear we shall not meet on earth. I am preparing for the end very quietly and calmly. The Lord is wonderfully near. He will not fail me. I was very restless and excited. While there seemed to be a chance of life, but God has taken that feeling away. And now I just pray for grace to meet the terrible end bravely. The pain will soon be over. And oh, the sweetness of the welcome above. Dear ones, she says, live near to God and cling less closely to the things of earth. There is no other way by which we can receive that peace from God which passes understanding. Well, Lizzie Atwater, martyred in China, sounds a lot like something Stephen would say. Well, now the struggle comes to us, and now the question comes to us, Pastor, what do I do with this message? So pay attention. The word martyr in Greek is the word martus in the Bible. Martus. Only four times is the word related to a believer dying for his faith. It refers to people living for their faith. In fact, listen to this. 161 times in the New Testament, martus in the Greek is translated into English witness. Only four times is that word martus referred to someone who dies for their faith. In all other instances, it refers to people living for their faith. Stephen was called to die for his faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called to live for our faith. A living martyr is one who has died to self. It is one who has put to death the ambitions of self-interest and the plans of self-absorption and self-sufficiency. He or she, as a living martyr, as a living witness, he or she has removed self-satisfaction as their primary purpose in life, meaning you're not so much concerned about what will make you happy and comfortable all the time. They have instead, as a living martyr, as a living witness, declared allegiance to and obedience to the challenge of Scripture that invites all of us in Romans 12:1 to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, surrendered, and acceptable to the Lord. And so there'll be three questions that go on the screen quickly as we close. There are several challenging questions for us as we end the message. Number one is this question from Stephen's life. Do I love God more than my own life? That's one of those big ones, right? That's a big one. It's easy to say yes in the comfort of a church chair, right? Do I love God more than my own life? You know that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's true. Why are we sitting here today? Because that seed, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That seed has grown and, and, and survived and thrived, and it's still here today. Do you recognize what we are a part of today? Do you recognize what has happened before us to, to make us so we could sit here in Red Bank, Tennessee, in relative complete freedom to do whatever we want and worship according to the dictates of our heart and conscience. You understand what people lived for and died for and fought for and bled for so that we could be here. It's not so we could casually live the Christian life. Here we are, thousands of years later, thousands, perhaps millions, have gone before us laying down their lives starting here with Stephen. Do you love God? more than you love your own life. Number two, <laughs> do I forgive others who have wronged me? 
His final prayer before dying was a prayer of forgiveness for those who were killing him. In my honesty and transparency, I've shared with you before how sometimes people share things with me that are truly upsetting or truly offensive to them, and I have to say, uh-huh. Pretty poor you. Must be awful. Did they stone you after that? Did they murder you? Please don't see or hear me being insensitive to you. I'm simply getting you to redraw your perspective. I know I've been hurt. You've been hurt. We, it's a natural part. Words do hurt. Many times I'd rather be stoned with stones than stoned with words. However, Stephen, what an example here. What grace, what glow, what perspective that as he's dying, the final words on his lips were those of mercy for his persecutors. Just like Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, lay not this sin to their charge. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Show mercy, you'll appreciate mercy. Appreciate mercy, you'll show mercy. We must endeavor to exercise forgiveness for others in the same way that Stephen forgives his murderers and in the same way, more importantly, that Christ has forgiven us. It's a tall order. And number three, these are heavy questions. Am I prepared to see the Lord when I die? I've sat by the deathbed of many believers, read scripture, uh, got, uh, got hands together, held hands is the phrase I'm looking for, I can't find it, I held hands and sung and, and, and looked in the face of someone who's about to meet their Lord and Savior and oh the peace and oh the joy and oh the serenity and the confidence they have as they are crossing from death to life, their, 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 their eyes will open in glory and they will see the Savior that died for them. And I've preached a number of funerals as well where I didn't know what to say because the person in the casket gave no evidence and no assurance to their family or by their life that they knew Jesus Christ as Savior. I just have to say things like, if so-and-so could come back today <laughs> from wherever they are, here's what they would say. Church member, you might be religious, but are you prepared to meet the Lord? New attender, visitor today, welcome guests. Are you prepared to meet the Lord? If you knew that you're going to die today, would you glow on your way out of here today? Would you, would you say, Lord Jesus, receive me into your presence? And would you in your mind see Jesus standing at the right hand of God? The uh, Bible is so interesting. The Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Why is he standing? Most commentators point out something kind of, uh, we can't prove it, but that Jesus stood up to applaud him and welcome him as the first martyr into heaven for his victory, for the way he victorious and victoriously ended his life. I've got to wrap up the message, but could you have this same attitude. Stephen is someone who died with complete confidence knowing where he was going. Do you have that? Do you have that today? And if you don't, let us take a Bible and show you from God's word how you can have that confidence, not of your own merit or your own religiosity or your own good work because of the merits and the work and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Oh, may the Lord give us the boldness and strength to live for the gospel that Stephen had in dying for the gospel. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed today. Would you join me and stand to your feet? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we stand to our feet today. The invitation questions, they are self-evident. Number one is this, do I love God? Here's what you should be thinking about, asking God to help you answer honestly and in your heart today, 
do I love God more than my own life? Think about how, how much you fight for your rights and how much you fight for your preferences and how much you want your own way. Do you love God more than your own life? Are you willing to, to live for him, indeed willing to die for him and die to yourself for the cause of Christ? Number three, or number two, do I forgive others? Ask yourself, consider your forgive. Do you forgive others who have wronged you? What an example that Stephen is. And number three, dear friends, are you prepared to see the Lord when you die? If you died right now, where would you go? If you died right now, do you have 100% confidence that you would see the Lord, see Jesus Christ at the right hand of God? Do you have that confidence? If God spoke to your heart today, if you answer those three questions, whatever the spiritual need is that you have, you can find answers here. People can pray with you. Please come to the altar as the pianos uh, uh, play in just a moment and, and, and kneel at the cross and ask God to help you this week to live the gospel, to share the gospel boldly, to not be ashamed. Ask God to help you have grace to forgive that person who, who wronged you, whether it was minor or major. Forgive that person and show them mercy as God has shown you mercy. If you're here today and need to be saved, you understand Christ, you're lost on your way to hell. Come, and we will take a Bible, and we'll go off another room, we'll take a Bible, we'll show you about the simple plan of salvation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you, and thank you for this time together today. Thank you for the impact that Stephen's life is still having thousands of years later. God, please impact us with this today. Please convict us of the weakness of what we call the Christian life today and embolden us and strengthen us to live with this testimony. God, you have called us to be a witness. You've called us to live the gospel and to preach and share the gospel with those around us, just like Stephen shows us. Lord, by your Spirit, give us the boldness and the wisdom and the spirit that Stephen had. And use us in this world. Use us in this world to make a difference. I pray you'll speak to individual hearts today, not just as a church. Individual hearts, Lord, we have a, we have a, who's, a who's your one on our minds. We have a person we're praying for. We have folks that we're burdened for. I pray that you'll speak to individual hearts today. Cut us to the heart where we need conviction. Help us to respond with humility. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Here come the instruments. You come. What is the need of your heart today, the need of your life, the need of prayer that you have? You come. Find a little quiet place and spend some time committing your ways to the Lord.